So, welcome to this video. What is it about today? There is a small control system from Siemens called Logo, which I believe is very powerful. This is indeed a small control system that can be obtained for relatively little money. One always thinks that small control systems, like PLC control in a compact format, are only suitable for operating garage doors up and down. To be applied for any projects that are so completely trivial, that's not true. They can do much, much more. They are network capable, and you can actually visualize with them, output text fields, etc. We will address this during the course of the setup course, so to speak, to thematize it, work on it, and perhaps look at a few project examples. Now, broadly speaking, the control system is actually more powerful than one initially believes. And yes, I am trying to present this in the simplest chronological way possible for you, so that everyone can manage the programming of a logo control system, even without any prior knowledge. Okay, so here is the interface of the Logosoft Comfort software from Siemens, as mentioned. And in the upper area, we have the common model, let's say, editing files, format view, extras, etc. I don't want to spend too much time on that. There are two modes. Here, diagram, mode, and network project. That will come later as well. This means that we can have multiple logos communicate with each other over the network at this point. It is designed to be very simple. However, we will first start with the basics. And for that, we will open a new project or create a new project and say thank you for the logo settings for now. We will do that later. Yes, so these settings are important, but at this moment they are somewhat irrelevant to us because if you only use the software without having the hardware, it's enough to carry out a certain level of planning. In other words, you first plan your project on paper. It looks no different than a sheet of paper in landscape format and can simulate everything. Test everything before you then say, okay, this works, I like it, I will now buy the hardware, and then you can transfer it, put everything into operation, and then the project runs as planned. So, once again, about this sheet of paper. So, this is the workspace of the software, and it can of course be expanded. It may seem a bit unusual at first glance to work in a landscape format. However, you quickly get used to it once you know what to pay attention to. You can expand your project with the setting here in the page layout window. Now you have four sheets arranged side by side. I wouldn't do that at the beginning. I would somehow expand this throughout the project as needed, so I can't recommend it, I don't do it. Of course, everyone can decide for themselves. I always start with page one, and then, as I said, it can be expanded and enlarged. So we have the tools up here. Simulation is also very important. We can simulate what we program or connect, meaning our logical connections, using the simulation button here, allowing us to see what works and what does not work. We can design multiple projects side by side, displaying them in a split window. We'll get to that later uh, as well. So in the network project, that makes perfect sense. And here we have a few features or tools that are relatively limited, but also important for the further course. To do this, one must have the following knowledge. The representation of our digital inputs and outputs. The logical blocks are represented in SFC based on FUP and FOP. FUP stands for Function Plan or Function Block Language. This means that we have blocks that are interconnected, creating a logical connection that can then be transferred to our control system, which will take over the function and respond according to our specifications. 2001 operates, however, one might express that. A control unit from the logo series typically has eight inputs and four outputs. Therefore, let's try the following now. We simply add four inputs by holding down the left mouse button and using drag and drop. We have the inputs one to four on the screen and one output Q. 
So we have now placed one of the four outputs here. And the first task would be that all four inputs must be active or true or one. So there must be a certain voltage present in the hardware. This is then represented here. So when there is voltage applied from the outside, it is shown in red here. And when all are active, Q should also be activated, but only then. This means it is an and operation. In the logo world, it is the case that the AND and OR blocks, or most of the blocks, unfortunately come with limited inputs. And you have to be a little clever about it. I'll get to that shortly. First, we connect everything together by dragging and dropping. So just hold it down, drag it over, and connect it all. We can now organize the inputs a bit differently here. By clicking on the line, you can move them around a bit to make it clearer, because that is actually the first disadvantage of the SFC representation, clarity. You need to take care of that. This means that when programming, one must ensure that everything remains reasonably clear. How do I do that? First, I created my logical connection, simulated it, and found that when I activate I, 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 and I, the output Q is also activated. That's already very good. It works. The simulation is very clear. We can also easily control the inputs in the lower area, and Q is represented as a light source. Everything is wonderful. The problem is what happens in two weeks, or in a month, or in half a year, when my project is relatively extensive and I haven't labeled anything. Then the following can happen. I can no longer cope with what I have programmed. To minimize this risk, I can recommend that you comment on the whole thing. We have a comment tool here, which is just a simple, let's say, an empty window that can be filled with text. I will simply call my project project, and I am currently in the tool for inserting comments. When I then press the escape key, I automatically switch to the selection because when I have selected in the selection and double click directly on my written text with this tool, I go to the attributes, to the attributes page. So I can determine here which font I use or in what size this text should be displayed. And you know this from other programs like Word, etc. Text editing programs where you can make certain presettings, and suddenly I might have the title of my project standing there. Below, I could write again a description of the function, meaning here I describe the function that can be found in this area, what actually happens there. I could write that now when I, 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 and I are active. It is self-explanatory at the moment, quite simple, but it can, of course, become more complicated. And then Q is activated, so to speak. So that covers the comment tool. We have another option when we use the um, selection tool on I. By double-clicking, we access the properties of the input block and can easily choose a different input here. For example, during the course of the project, we suddenly say, OK, I is not the right input. It should be I. Then it's just a click of the mouse. And we have converted I to I or I to E, which is certainly very helpful. Otherwise, you would have to delete the line here, delete the input, and then pull in another input again. And yes, it would definitely be much more complicated if one couldn't do that. I find it very comfortable this way. You set the correct input, and everything else can remain as it is. That's it for that. Then the important component in these settings is the comment window. Here we can write, for example, a button from my side or something else. And it should actually, oh right, yes, I'm sorry. I just changed a parameter here. I should have clicked OK. I should have opened it again. It's a bit annoying, but that's just how it is. And then click OK again. Then in the upper area, the comment or the title 
of my input or the description of my input appears. I can place this description anywhere I want when I click on it with the selection tool. But the interesting thing is that when I move the input, the comment moves along with it. And that is very good because if you had done that with the tool, you would practically have to click on both the text and the input together to move them around. It is really very convenient that you can simply move the input and its attributes essentially move along with it. And I can only recommend naming the corresponding inputs here as they can be found in the hardware or in the outside world. For example, if this were a lamp, you would write lamp um, ceiling, lamp garage, etc. We click on the line once and can split it, and we can split it, and we can split it. Or we can also right-click on the line and select Split. That works too. The advantage is that I can now practically separate the components from each other without the lines being dragged along. For the sake of overview, one might be able to present the whole thing differently now. You can spread things out a bit so that you can also see, okay, this is I, and by clicking on I at this point, I can connect to the partner, and then it shows me where their partner actually is. I can reconnect everything, and then I have the line back. This is also a very important component. Back again. And one more thing is important. If we wanted to set the same output with eight inputs, we would have a problem because in the software, Logo Soft Comfort, it is not possible, or only possible through certain workarounds to expand the AND block. In other words, I can't just say that I need 586 inputs right now. Instead, I would actually have to add another block to the program, link it through a third block, and then connect that to the output. And so I have essentially created a combination of one and block that actually represents a single block consisting of eight inputs. I could now say, okay, input five, six, seven, and eight, and I will connect them with that. Yes, and so I can actually expand it. It's a bit confusing, but nonetheless, it is possible. That's what it's about. Such things are just growing pains, I would say, of the software. You have to be aware of them. If you know that, then you also know how to handle it, and then you can solve even the most difficult tasks, I would say. The last function I would like to show you in this video is the help function. For example, if you don't know what a forward and backward counter can do, you can simply hover the left mouse button over the block for a little longer. It then appears, or rather the display is enlarged, and you have a question mark in the right area that you can click on, which opens another window with very extensive documentation. Help file, where you can really find all components or all parameters listed. Here is an example. There is a lot of text that actually explains the function of a forward and backward counter. Yeah in this case. There is a timing diagram here, so in most cases you can really read up on it wisely. And yes, if necessary, I can also, which I actually always do, play around with the component first. So I try out what it can do, and if I get stuck, I can always open the help file and answer the remaining questions with it. So that's it for now. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, bye.